Uh, let's do a screen share and we're going to do desktop number two. So I'll be forward with the team in relation, there we go. I'll be forward with the team in relation to the uh, end of this particular chapter. Um, as I was studying and processing the different geome types in relation to the examples in the book, um, we got down to the 2D, 3D uh, section. So uh, I am going to cover that topic. I just have to switch over back to the book and then talk about that subject directly. Um, so we uh, team this uh, particular week, we were covering chapter five, which is statistical summaries. Uh, with this particular text or this section of our GG Plot book club, the chapter five is going to talk about multi um, uh, variable or, or, or uh, objects that have a lot more data related to them and then being able to discover in that uh, data set uh, any correlation, uh, really the XY uh, correlation uh, between the two. So I wrote two learning objectives to start out. Uh, the first one being uh, using ggplot2 to plot the possible uncertainty in your data. This entire chapter talks about uncertainty and so I'm categorizing this section as more of a discovery path. And we've got a data frame. Uh, we may know some uh, theories or hypothesis about the data frame, but let's plot and, and see the correlation between our uh, X and Y coordinates. Uh, determining which geometric object or geome best rep uh, presents your data or type of data. We'll talk about uh, uh, discrete data points and then continuous data points. Uh, they, they spent a lot of time in that subject. Okay, moving on. So we haven't done this every time and I found that there was one particular noun that was used or an object in this text that I've never heard before. And so I started to build a little bit more uh, definitions surrounding this particular chapter and wanted to share them with the team. Um, I didn't find a direct source of a dictionary or any sort of definitions document that our studio has. Um, I went into the big book of R and I didn't find anything that was directly pulled out either um, because we're using the online version of our ggplot uh, GG book. Um, I didn't see a definitions chapter or an index type chapter. So these are uh, uh, my own words. Uh, please feel welcome to uh, critique them and or add your own definitions as well. The first one I wanted to cover is just the term discrete value. So a discrete value is something of finite uh, within your data. You can count it up, you can come to an end. Uh, there is uh, categorical data would be a good example of a discrete uh, value. Um, it's, it's a known value. The, the example I read online was uh, if you were to count the change in your pocket, right? That's a finite value. We know how much change is in your pocket. Uh, it's not continuous forever. You know, you're, you're not becoming rich by pulling more money out of your pocket, or at least I don't uh, anyway. So I listed a discrete value as a finite number, something that is countable with beginning and end. The second term that we use in this text is continuous values. Now, continuous is slightly different in the sense that it is an infinite number. Right, there's an infinite amount of, of uh, precision that we can add to a to a decimal point. Right, it just goes off into infinity. How precise do you want it to be? Well, it doesn't matter. It just goes off infinitely. So that would be a continuous uh, continuous value. The term that I pulled out of the book uh, that was most specific was the word grobs. I've never heard of a grob before, but it stands for graphical object. I had to Google this and and make an association to it. Um, is there anybody on the call that have ever used that term before in their day-to-day -day, uh, workflow? Um, I found it kind of, uh, I stumbled over it thinking maybe it could have been a misspelled word. And then when I started to uh, uh, learn more about what the term implies in a ggplot uh, or a grammar of graphics, the word grob stands for a graphical object. So we call them geometric objects or, or geomes, but technically if you wanna call any figure, caption, uh, graph or anything, uh, the more global term uh, that encompasses would be a graphical object or a grob. The last one is the term overplotting. And in this case, uh, it was highlighted in the text um, we find in at least the data science statistical world, the potential of overplotting data. Uh, you're, uh, you, you lose 
resolution, everything just kind of paints over the top of it. And you, you really don't know what you're seeing yet until I quote unquote, maybe this is a bad term, but I'm saying that you zoom in and zoom out of the data. I don't think that's probably the right term to use. I, I think of a, like a mapping feature, right? Am I staring at the bark of a tree or am I zooming out to 60,000 foot and looking at the entire forest? That over plotting concept would be able to uh, delineate or, or separate so you get some uh, a good correlation, visual correlation with your, with your data. Okay, moving on. So the first, I just have one comment. Sorry, yeah, Ryan. Those stand. are those are great definitions. Um, the yeah. one, I guess, caveat about the discrete versus continuous in yes, R, and I can't remember whether we talked about this or whether I just brought this up in the Slack channel. Um, everything's kind of blending together, but R treats or ggplot treats integers as continuous variables or continuous values. So, so, like, when we move on to like the scaling chapter where we're like modifying scales in the the grob well there's me using that term in the wild um you go. using the you know modifying the graphical object instead of like the underlying data we would have to pass like uh, arguments to scale you know continuous if we're mapping to integers um even though it seems like it should be discrete because they're not like any you know decimal or, or fractional number but I made a comment about categorical data and, and I'm going to use a term. I don't know if everyone would recognize my implication of, of this definition, but enumerations. So if you have a categorical data, uh, uh, male, female, um, uh, maybe a country code, right? Zero through whatever number uh, of a country code. I consider that a discrete value because it's an enumeration. There is a a numeric value that is associated with that uh, particular um, country. Is that maybe a good way of, of encapsulating, Stan, in your definition I, too? I think so. And I think, um, yeah, like if you were to do that, I, although I have a hunch, like if you were to try to plot, like, I don't know, some continuous distribution for, um, like each of your like levels of like a cat, like a country code, it, yeah there would be issues with, I think that was like what I brought up in the Slack when I showed these two plots side by side was that it maps continuous data to like a range. I see. Versus like you're treating it as a factor and you would need to like then either add a grouping variable or make explicitly define that that integer as a factor. Good point. Um, no, but I, I think like any integer, it, it just treats as continuous, even though we might want it to be like um, like a discrete class, like you said. Yeah, well, and, and I, I, I put on here for purposes of learning, uh, any input user uh, uh, critique or, or uh, definition is welcomed as well. So Stan, I appreciate you adding uh, that in there. I don't know if that's a hard, fast rule. Um, when I was covering this particular section of this chapter, um, I seemed to try and think of the, the different data sets, uh, the, the primary data sets that we're, we'll be seeing here in a moment of, that limit, uh, or or if it's not a limit, you know, and you plot a histogram, you know, how how far of of difference do you have in between all of your your input? So, good good comment, sir. Ryan, I had one other um, yeah. item on those two on the discrete and the continuous. I saw a definition explained a couple maybe a week or two ago <clears throat> that talked about um, that discrete values in a lot of ways can cannot take a value in between two. Right discrete values so um so if you're given like um say like male female like there's nothing in between male female if that's the in theory right yes right yeah or um or the country codes like there's nothing in between two country codes yeah uh, obviously geographically yes but uh, but not in a, in a list sense but uh, continuous values on the other hand uh, values in between what you're looking at are, are still possible. So things like time end up being continuous. Um, yeah. And, and decimals, like there's always another decimal in between the two that you're looking at. So, um, so while I think discrete values generally are finite and continuous values generally are infinite, uh, I don't know that that's entirely what describes them as much as the ability, like the, the, the possible values. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, just some I, mean, so other, I was just thinking you know. on that note. So I think last time we were discussing this as well when we had 
different plots, uh, you know, talking about that. Um, so now, from for an example, I was just thinking. So I think last time I I mentioned this. So age would be a continuous variable, mm -hmm. but month, however, would be a discrete variable because you are looking at either month one, month two. You know whether it's for sales or I mean for whatever time point. Um, yeah, just want to throw an example. Well, and I guess that gets back to what I'm saying. Like like R doesn't ggplot doesn't know that like that you're, that it's month, right? It just sees an integer and it mm -hmm. like, it interprets that as continuous. So like in the Slack channel, I, I forget how exactly I did it, but it was like number of cylinders and in the cars data set and there's only vehicles only have four, I think it's four, five, six, and eight. They don't have seven, but then yeah. when you plot that as a continuous variable, it, it interpolate or like, uh, what do you call it? it? It like, you know, plots that range on the X axis as a continuous um, range of data and not right. as like discrete. Um, so that's the, kind of what I meant. Cause I, yeah, cause I've run into this so many times and then now mm -hmm. finally understanding like, Oh, this, now this makes sense why this is happening. Yeah. I, 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 I'm always welcome to uh, any input and debate educational debate on the definitions of terms because in, in the, in the life of a, software engineer, statistician, data scientist, or, or data engineer, you really have to define exactly what that is, whatever the object or whatever the subject we're discussing, you have to define that so that its implication can be uh, manipulated in the future. And so um, I'll, let me see if I can add to these notes. So my intent is after I'm finished with the presentation, I'll upload these to our ggplot GitHub. Um, Priyanka, uh, you may have noticed, I don't know if you get notified, uh, but I did a pull request last night as I was editing some of our content, uh, whether yourself or John accept those changes, uh, review or accept those changes. Um, this might be an area I can reinforce. Sure. Okay. Continuing on the subject, so the first graphs that we receive in this particular topic, they talk about four different types. And I guess uh, my markdown document didn't work the way I wanted it to, so I apologize. Um, there's four different focuses that the book or the author is expressing in relation to how you would use these particular geomes to express your data. So the first one is if you had a discrete value X and that you wanted to plot the range, we would either use an error bar or a line range as an option. Now, I did smile and laugh. If you actually count up the plot types, there's more than four. Uh, so the definition when, when the author was referring to these, it's, it's uh, being able to choose the graph within this particular context. So if we had a discrete value X and we wanted to plot the range, we would either use error bar or line, uh, uh, line range. If we had a discrete value X and we wanted the range and the center or the centroid of that range, then we would use either a crossbar or a point range, very, uh, point range geome. The third type is if we had a continuous value of X and we wanted to plot the range of that X. So that would be either a geome ribbon. The fourth type would be a continuous X and we want to plot the range and the centroid or center of that uh, uh, value, then we would use a geome smooth uh, with the stat value uh, of identify. Priyanka and Ryan, any Stan, anybody that is on the call, please feel welcome. I do want to ask a rhetorical question to the, to the book club. I couldn't find any relation. I couldn't find any defined point where we use the word identif uh, our identity within the stat variable, uh, stat function. If I go to ggplot and I use this geome smooth uh, uh, help menu, it does make reference to position using the identity as the, uh, the pointer or the, uh, I won't call it bin, don't use that word, but the stat value, uh, it uses it in position, but not in stat. Um, would anybody like to allude to maybe where this identity comes in? And I know I think, Ken. Um, yeah, I think this is, I mean, this has been a while since I've read this, so maybe somebody that's done this more recently can comment as well. But I think in the R for data science book, they talk about how like the, the geome 
functions and the stat functions are sort of interchangeable yeah. in a way like you can call different arguments to one versus another and get the same result and they so are, the stat identity i think it's just like you're not performing any statistical transformation you're just using the data as they are well there was a it's a geom smooth and stat smooth those are aliases of each other they both yeah. do the same function and you call the stat smooth if you are Oh, there's a there's a sentence that I'm thinking of. I may jump over to the book and show you the exact sentence that I'm highlighting. But Stan, you are correct. Um, Geom smooth and stat smooth are both uh, aliases of each other. The functions, the underlying functions, the mathematics that go into it are the same. Um, my question is more related to the stat equals identity. The, the, de the definition of identity, I couldn't find anywhere in any of the help menus, any of the so, CRAN, yeah. I think what I understand from, from that, like stat as an option is, um, so it depends on what, so depending on what input you are giving to your data and how you want to use the geom. So for example, if I give, uh, you know, let's say transaction level, sales level data, to a geom point and I want it to, um, uh, you know, I want to use a geom histogram or maybe geom bar to do some manipulation, let's say. So I think count is by default. So it would, geom bar would do that, but geom column has a default of stat equal to identity while geom bar has a count, uh, stat equal to count is the default. So if I were to use, the, the same data. So in geom bar, if my X is, let's say, uh, region, uh, you know, it would give me the count of transactions at each region. Uh, but if I have to do the same thing for geom call, I would have to first aggregate my data and then use it into geom call because then it is it is going to use that as identity. I mean, so identity, when, when you use static equal to identity, from what I understand is that, you know, it uses the data as it is. So if you have a count, uh, you know, like some categorical variable and n, so then whatever n has, it goes in as it is. Like it won't do the manipulation on the data. Like it will not do the count or it will not do any averages if you will, you know, it, it'll it will show the data as it is. I think that's that's what, what, I, what I understand. I, my, my, anytime I see the quotation marks, I always think that that is calling on some global environmental variable. And I couldn't find anything that said identity as a, as a, uh, as a, uh, a named um, variable. And so that was why I was trying to figure out where the word identity came into this whole mix. Um, the, the, the stat equals, and then if we had some other argument past that, some other mathematic equation I'll show you here in a moment what I'm referring to. Um, it's the word identity that I wasn't comfortable with. I couldn't find a relation to explain exactly where the word identity came from. But Priyanka, yeah, I think you're... I think, yeah, for me, it means like as it is. Like, you know, like in chunks, you say um, results as is. So it's like that. So, you know, say you, you don't want to change your statistics element. So you just keep, use, use that as it is for your plot whichever plot you're using it in. Perfect. That's a great explanation. Uh, so this first type that we're going to discuss is called a crossbar. So we're calling on the base value uh, ggplot and we're creating a data frame. Uh, before I begin there, let me start at the top. So we created a, a list of <clears throat> the numbers 18, 11, and, and 16, and we assigned those to uh, the, the named variable y. We create a data frame uh, using the, data, the base R data frame function. We create a list, uh, numbers one through three, uh, and then we pass the Y value of the assigned um, uh, list that we created a moment ago, uh, SE. I didn't know if that stood for standard error or where the number, I, I couldn't find a definition of SE either, uh, but it does, I'll explain in a moment what these three numbers represent. Uh, 1.2, 0 0.5, and 1.0. As you plot this particular point, we're telling it to ingest the data frame that we just created um, using the uh, aesthetic of X and Y. Here, this is where the, the magic really happens. So they talk about the Y minimum and Y maximum. 
in this equation, we have y minus se, and then for y max, we put it as y plus se. So here's where you start to create this particular crossbar formula. If I look at the numbers, excuse me, let me see if I can show that, uh, numbers 18, 11, and 16, that is plotted on our y coordinate system, right? So the first one is 18, the second is going to be 11, and the, the, the third is going to be 16. The SE values that we're seeing here is giving us the distance across or the height of the y and x relationship uh, from where the number 18 is and then plus 1.2 and minus 1.2. Um, or if I go to the number 11, which is your darker black line, and then I go 0.5 above and 0.5 below. Same can be said about our number 16, the uh, plotted point or the line, and then uh, 1, sorry, 1 1.0 above and 1.0 below. So what you're doing is you're bounding or, or you're, you're encapsulating the values as it's plotting in this particular crossbar form. Scrolling down to the second visual, we use a point range. And so in the point range formula, we're just putting it at uh, 18 and one, and then we're giving it that same distance point. So instead of a, a, a box that we're spreading across uh, or rising or lowering behind, uh, we're plotting the, the single point of X, Y coordinates and then giving it the range above and below. And again, it just follows that same 1.2, 1.0, or 0.5 and then 1.0. I have a question, actually, because I have to go and update my slides regarding um, the low-level geoms. So yes. then for like um, the geom box plot, so that would be like geom crossbar, and then is it going to be geom point, point range, or is it geom line range? Uh, good question. Uh, line range is going to be showing up here in a moment. Uh, we'll, I'll show you an example of that uh, in, in just a few moments. Um, the first three that you see in this particular chapter five, uh, I think they're all three side by side to each other, uh, but it's crossbar, uh, point, range, yeah, point range, and then the third is going to be a geom smooth. Uh, we are actually fitting the data into that uh, uh, particular geom type. I'll show you a line range here in a moment. There's gonna be a, another example coming up with that. Did I answer your question, Lydia? Yes, thank you. So team, what the last version here, this geom smooth, uh, we're doing some other mathematical manipulation inside this particular call. And so you're plotting your three points. That's the uh, top 18, the number 11, and the number 16. And then its range within its uh, x coordinates. Uh, uh, the first one is going to be at 1.0, second is 2.0, and the third is at 3.0. I'll show. Uh, let's do this real quick, team. I'm gonna I'm gonna minimize this for a second, and let's go to our studio, and I'll just show you what I'm referring to here. So here is our coordinate system. So I'm gonna go inside here. I'm gonna add one more point of just. Uh, the DF, uh, just list DF. So there's our data frame. And the reason I'm wanting you to see the correlation of what these this first chunk of code was doing, we set up a very mi minor data frame, but this can expand into infinity if, if you wanted a lot of data. But we just said X coordinates of one, two, and three. Just give me the sequential numbers one, two, and three. Uh, we gave it the double entries of 18, 11, and 16 for our Y coordinates. And then finally that SE, and that's why I was asking if anybody knew what the acronym of SE implied. Uh, these are the uh, distances above and below your Y coordinates or their interaction between X and Y. So that's 1.2, 0.5, and 1.0. As you apply those points to these particular geomes, it really kind of makes sense on how it's applying those uh, uh, values in a, in a graphical form. Next one. Um, Ryan, um, yes. I wanted to assure you that uh, SE is the standard error. It is standard so, error, okay. Yeah, it is, and you use it to calculate the confidence intervals, which are I've... the uh, 
the value plus and minus the standard error. I didn't find that pulled out directly. Thank you, uh, Federica, for, for clarifying that. Um, I didn't see it directly in the text uh, or, or any of the help menus, what the acronym SE stood for. Again, similar to that comment I made about the identity. Um, I may be coming at this a little bit naive. So I was searching for just what SE stood for with relation. And now I lost my bits. So let me see if I can pull that back up. Is everybody's time for this to process? Okay. There is okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's talked about Geom Smooth, uh, Geom Error Bar. Um, this one I didn't, I didn't find any uh, direct um, association with, but it may just be the examples that we're using for this uh, small point. There, there's your data. Um, so similar to that box plot that we had before, this error bar is giving us the, the vertical line of where our y coordinates is, and then the, the uh, kind of I-beam sort of look to it, your upper and lower limits of that, uh, which would be your Y max and your Y minimum. Okay. It's, it's similar to the box plot, only you're missing a box. Uh, it kind of has that more I-beam sort of look instead of a vertical line, sorry, horizontal line where your, your Y coordinate limit is and then above and below. Here, we're plotting a, a vertical line at that X coordinate system, one, two, and three, and then giving it a range above and below. Uh, Geom line range, uh, Lydia, I think you used the term line plot. Uh, that will come up in a second, but um, here is just a Geom line range. Um, the length of vertical line is a representative of not only where the plotted X point and Y point are at, but then also the length of the line is going to be a representative uh, of the uh, distribution or the interaction of Y minimum and Y maximum. Final topic, and this one I can't make heads or tails of. I couldn't find a story that I could apply to it uh, because it looks like Geom Smooth, uh, but it doesn't have your nice shadowed gray blue line and then the, the gray behind it. Uh, I believe what Geom Ribbon is doing is uh, giving a full opacity to the uh, fit of this uh, range. And if anybody would like to add to that statement, please feel welcome to. Oh. How I interpreted it, because like, like looking at this chapter is like, okay, it answers a lot of the questions from the chapter I did, chapter three. So I think um, what they had said was like, this geom ribbon was a low level for um, geom smooth. So then I, from what I understood, this is kind of like plotting the standard error. There we that go. That's kind of what I thought, yeah. Yeah, that's a great example, Lydia. And I, I use the term, uh, the fit model. Uh, a lot of times when you use that geom smooth, um, you've got your, your regressive line, uh, linear regression or, or logical regression. Um, and then the fitting is that kind of gray undertone of the error between the, the points. It kind of really shows where the outlier type media is. I took the comment of opacity as being the... Uh, non-shadowed full fill uh, 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 method of the same plot. Uh, they look the same, but two different graph styles, geome styles. Yeah, uh, thank you. Continuing on. So the next topic is talking about weighted data. In the mindset of, of a statistical modeling type standpoint, we always talk about the weight of our data uh, or the weight of a variable. Um, how much, uh, I always use the term gravitational pull. I may be uh, in error with that comment. Uh, it's kind of like throwing in some physics into statistics, but uh, I always view weighted values as, as this kind of gravitational pull or, or kind of the bloatness of, of the uh, data. The first example is a Midwest um, data set. It's part of the core uh, base uh, uh, ggplot data sets. Uh, what we're plotting here is the percentage of white and then the percentage below poverty line. With this particular unweighted plot, 
we notice that there is a density towards the 100% value. Now, there's a term, and I'm hoping that I'm stating it correctly and so that I don't mispronounce it or give it misrepresentation, but um, heteroskenactacity, I believe is the, the application where you start to either see a fan out of your data plot, your scatter plot, um, or it starts to zero into one point. So one of the means in which you could uh, 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 sorry, correct that uh, plotting of you know, uh, zooming into one point uh, uh, or, or fanning out into infinity is uh, ordered least squares uh, or, or least squares regression. Um, you're actually uh, squaring the value and then kind of nullifying any positives and negatives. I only bring that up because here in a moment, you're going to see why that uh, comment comes in. In this first initial plot, it doesn't really do much for us other than just plotting data points. Okay. We could view this as saying, well, I see a very high percentage of, of white, but then also um, a low level of poverty level, right? Uh, far, it's implied that farmers aren't overly rich. And so just based on this particular graph, I can see that most of my data is plotting uh, to the 100% uh, uh, white level and then the poverty uh, poverty level being on the lower scale. Okay. Continuing on, now if we add a weight, if we add a, a, a kind of a bloatness to these plots, now it starts to make sense what's going on here. So what you're doing is you're kind of almost grouping your data together in likeness. So the uh, population in millions here in a moment, I'm going to do some math here for, you, for uh, the team. But again, it's the same uh, plot type, geopoint, and the aesthetics is going to now add size of population total, and then we divide it by a million decimals, or uh, sorry, a million uh, points. So that's scientific notation, it's 1E6. Uh, you just have one with six zeros on the end of it. Okay. Then we also scale the size of the area in relation we add another uh, point where it's population in millions. That's where this little side legend comes in. And then we break it with 0.5, 1, 2, and 4. So by passing these four numbers, it's going to pull our data together uh, and, and make it that kind of more gravitational form. We see this a lot with population maps. Um, sometimes you may witness it on heat maps as well, different color codes related to heat maps. Scrolling down, here's where I discuss the term heteroskenectacity. And if I'm mispronouncing that term, please team feel welcome to correct my, my vocabulary. I am great for mispronouncing things. So this line of the linear model, right, uh, Frederica, this is one of those points where I do know what that number or that acronym means. Uh, as we use a geom smooth, uh, plot and then use the method of linear model and have a scale of one, you can see that your regressive line or your, your fit model, this gray shadow area, it all kind of gravitates towards one center point. Okay. Um, if the data plot was a different way, we may see you know a, a fan out of it. Um, both of these are uh, red flags for anybody that's doing any sort of uh, statistical modeling. Um, it's being able to, to accommodate it, correct it, and then get some, some good uh, points out of the, the information you're plotting. Um, in uh, th this case, the jumps moot, uh, um, it, it's not, uh, it's using the linear model method but it's not making, um, it's using the formula, but it's not fitting a model. Exactly. It's not. The... So it's, not it's, it's exactly that. You say that uh, um, it's making a relationship within these two variables because, um, uh, and um, establish the the relationship within this two, the, these two variables as a linear relationship. Okay. In fact, it is, and the the direction they go. Basically. Okay. It, it is starting up at the the top left of the line and then drawing it down to the bottom right line. Correct. 
Frederica, that's the that's your linear line that you're referring to. Yeah, yeah. And that that again correlates to our plotted uh, points, right? Uh, the the linear model of all of the points is what gives us that grayed out area, right? Basi basically, no. it it takes the first the the um, it uh, connects two points, the two extreme points. Okay. It basically calculates the the least distance uh, within okay. the points, uh, and uh, it put it on a straight line because otherwise you can use different uh, methods and okay. find the different results. In this case, it has just like connected the, the minimum to the maximum. Okay, and uh, uh, while the other points are following the, the least distance. I see. Within that. Wait, yeah. so it, it does not, it does not fit a, a model? Or it just uses the formula. I'm con I think I'm confused about that. Um, he uses the he uses the method linear model. Stand to to add to Frederica's thought. I've always witnessed, or again, I may be projecting my own theory into this. So please feel welcome to to debate my comment. I've always found that the shadowed areas, or anytime you fit anything it's being able to apply the range of expectation, that shadowed area. Here's my, my linear line. And then based on the, the distances of that plotted points, that's where you get those, that, that gray uh, background or that shadowing. Rodrigo, do you want to add to that statement or? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm just saying that a linear model is just, um... Uh, like the y, the predictor equals to x and some other um, um, so a variation of of the x. But in this case, you you uh, you are not um, so. It, this confused me as well. Okay, <laughs> just to say this, um, but you're not a. Mm, you, uh, you just uh, uh, like calculating the, the distances within the, the values to uh, understand the, the main pattern. And the, the model will be, um, uh, yes, in some senses it's, it's a model because it takes consideration just of these two variables, the X and the Y. There is no other things um that is taking consideration of uh, i don't know if you, um, does make sense so you have a, uh, a data set with some variables which are the predictors it just taking consideration of these two and uh, it's some in, in some sense it's a model because th this is method the linear uh, model there was a there was a comment in the text, Frederica, uh, <laughs> around this same area. No, I think you're you're definitely applying the right uh, thought. What I noted was the fact that uh, weighted values may just be part of the mathematics of the geome. It's not anything that we have relation to or can view. So the uh, function when I call geome smooth and all of the underlying uh, arithmetic that goes into uh, processing that data frame or processing that data set, um, it's all internal to the to the smooth point. Um, the linear model is just giving us that blue line, correct? Am I stating that accurately? Yeah, sorry. I, I, like, I understand what the yeah. linear model is doing. I think okay. I, I thought I just heard that it doesn't it doesn't actually run the linear model, but that I was confused by that because I don't know how you could then get the the mean response is the blue line and then no. calculate your standard error. I, have, I, I, I may be adding, again, I'm probably being a little too overzealous on my, my statement. The gray area and as it uh, comes to a point towards our 100% or around our plotted area, anytime that I see that uh, sort of mm, focus point or, or a fan out in the data, I immediately know that there's some outliers that are are being a little bit too crazy with with uh, pulling our mathematics in weird ways. 
So being able to accommodate that by using some other uh, term of, of like a square root or a, or a squared function automatically, well, squared, squared function, it automatically nullifies any positives or negatives in the data. And it's not passing an absolute value, but it's kind of doing a similar uh, function. Again, I may be too extreme in my uh, uh, explanation of what's going on. I apologize. I'll go ahead and keep moving. Um, I did find this uh, informative, this geom smooth, or at least with this Midwest data set um, and how it was plotted. I'm going to I'm going to have a rhetorical question here in a moment for the team. So the weighted by population. So this is shifting slightly. Now we're going to uh, combine our previous uh, weighted values, the numbers in association to the plot line. And again, so it's just combining the two together. Uh, we're still incorporating that same linear model format, um, giving it a weight value of population total and then scale sized area to none. So the points are now kind of bloated or they're grouped together. They have more uh, significance visually on the plotted output, whereas minor values that may not uh, directly have relation are now really tiny. Um, again, I found this uh, kind of informative in relation to, to what it was doing. Um, where did my math go? Uh, I think it's this next section. There's a point where I'm going to be messing around with the values and I'm going to ask the team a rhetorical question on, am I plotting it correctly or, or was this a mistake in the book? I think it may just be me. But um, the next one is going to be the histogram. And arguably histograms are the simplest, easiest, and most visually acceptable way. There's a comment coming up here in a moment talking about histograms in general. It may be the first plot format for us to view correlation of data. So here we're using, again, that Midwest data set. We're using the aesthetic of percent below poverty, and then we're adding the uh, histogram value of bin width equals one. We use a Y label of countries, and that gives us our, our label on the, on the far left side. In this particular histogram, you can view that the mean value or the, the distribution of our data seems to be right here at this 10% level or this number 10, right? Uh, I'm implying that it's a percent value based on percent below poverty. Uh, so it, it appears that most of our population within this data set is in that 10% category. Okay. Scrolling down a bit, here's where I'm gonna start playing with some math. So again, bin width is one population now is going to be labeled as in the thousands. So again, I'm not saying that we scaled anything. I'm using the term zooming in and zooming out as maybe a really poor way of expressing what's going on. We're, we're, we're being able to uh, get closer to our data as we're plotting it, or we're stepping away and seeing the whole data set as a, as a, a, a holistic uh, function. In this case, the weight value and bin width is passing it in thousands. And what I found scratched my head was we went into scientific notation on the side here. Well, because it's based in millions. So this is actually 8 million, but then it adds the label of thousands. And for me, I had an immediate red flag in, in that relationship. I said, that doesn't look right. That's not plotted right. Um, or it's not scaled properly, I guess. And I've never witnessed scientific notation on the side. So Frederica, I know you're very much more uh, in tune with manipulating in ggplot. So if you know of a way of changing that uh, uh, scale into something more appealing, uh, please feel welcome to jump in. Here's what I did in a moment. So I thought this was an error by the number of thousands. So I didn't change the plot. So just know that this next point I said, question for the group. I said, is the above Y label correct? Check out the next two figures and see if there's a difference. So what I did is I just divided the population total by a thousand. What happened on the end is now I'm showing that I've got 8,000 instead. So I went away from the distance of numbers or, or digits in that scientific notation. And now I just scaled it to uh, being a thousand instead. Again, I don't know if this is accurate or, or appropriate. The third plot line that I added here was 
I divided by a million. So I took the weighted population total divided by a million and I changed the Y label on the side to be in millions instead. So now if I were a viewer or, or a receiver of this information that we're ge uh, generating and, and, and adding a story to it, now I can see that the number 8 million, right, as I put these two numbers together, it means more. It has nothing to do with this section of the document team. I'm only putting that in there because I thought the label was a little bit weird. Yeah, my my sense is that you did it right, and it may have just been a typo in the yeah. in the text. Um, <clears throat> I was trying to make heads and tails of the weight versus size in the aesthetic. So, is there a way to understand? Because it, in in a different um, code, you use uh, within the aesthetic, you use size equals. Yes. Uh, uh, was that was that this plotted area up here, Ryan? Right there. Yeah, right there. So under geom point, you've got size within the aesthetic, and then under geom smooth, you got weight within the aesthetic. And so I wonder, it seems like they're doing the same thing. Is it just um, the you you pick one based off of the geom they're using? It's it's like this. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Stan. Oh, go sorry. Ahead. I I was gonna say I I kind of found this confusing too, but I think with geom smooth anyway, we know that it's calling a linear model and like I think you know you can pass weight arguments to that linear model or whatever model you decide to use and so I think for the geom smooth the weight is going to um I mean the, the line looks different but it's probably because it's you know it's weighting those um values differently in the model call but then for like some of these other ones I, I don't think it changes anything on the underlying data it just kind of scales the shape or the size or whatever Okay. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, then could you scroll down a little? Simple, Sorry, go ahead. Very simple uh, linear model. Yes, I don't think you can change anything. Yeah, uh, and it takes I guess just like a for the method LM, a linear model or, or other type of methods, but you cannot set a, a model as you like, like changing the formula or whatever it is. So it's a very simple one, taking just the two variables that you have x and y. You can you can you add can the formula. The method. You can add the formula. I was mm. going to add the comment. The, I don't know. The... I don't know because uh, uh, I'm I'm just coming from the tidy models, and uh, so I've seen many. Uh, com more compl complex things. Uh, I use this uh, geom smooth just to 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 do this. And I yes, you maybe can can change it. Of course, yes, you can add the formula. Why? How do you change it? How would you change it? So it's in um in the method call. Like if you type geom smooth, if you if you scroll up, Ryan. Yes. Um. So it says like geom smooth. So I, I was actually like looking at the GitHub like source code as we were talking about this to try to understand. Um, but so you can pass like another argument in the geom smooth call. So like method equals LM, or you could say method equals GLM for generalized linear okay. model. I forget which other ones there are and it'll fit, it'll call that, but I don't, but yeah, you can't like modify the, the formula, so to speak, because yeah, you're only gonna be, you know, mapping a response and a predictor or yeah, but, modeling uh, a response yes, no, to the predictor. No, you're absolutely right. Okay, I meant just that you cannot like adding other variables maybe, or you can, uh, I don't, right. uh, like you can, can you add the formula inside the geom's mood? Um, I, that I'm not sure about. I don't know if that, if you can do that within the, the call or whether that's just handled by the, uh, some of the internal like helper functions um i'm you looking can. at the uh, yeah you can so the formula is set yeah, to you null. Can add the formula. Uh -huh. yeah but okay. i guess like by default if you you know if you use like i guess the method by default is lm and right. you know it'll no, just no, inherit that, whatever that's... formula yes and no do you absolutely right yes you can answer, uh, uh, Ryan, your question in relation to the weighted value. So in this particular example, or, or the one uh, corresponding above, the weight is a ratio 
of the data itself. So imagine that you took the sum or, or you grouped it together. Don't get into gaming squared or centroids at all. That's not what I'm getting at. Just imagine mathematically arithmetic, basic math. You're summing up the value, dividing it by this particular uh, uh, point. And then that gives you the radius of the circle. And I, I use the word bloat to represent that. Um, you'll find a lot of times when you're using this type of service and, and using a weighted value to represent graphically that things get skewed. Um, I love looking at the world map and then let's just say, you know, let's plot how many R users are in the world, right? So that's one uh, point that you could probably find online quickly Googling it. The world looks really, really weird because the countries aren't scaled to size. It's in relation to the amount of R users that you have and then it, it, it grows or shrinks dependent. So that weighted value is a is a mathematical interpretation. Yeah, makes sense that when by adding weight, it now those the larger counties pull the line towards the ones that have larger weight. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, we're about five minutes before we're done, uh, Ryan. I or Priyanka. I don't think I'm going to be able to finish because I'm not even to the to the uh, uh, hex uh, graphing uh, color coding section yet. Um, I'm at the end of my slide deck or getting close to the end of my slide deck. Um, the next point I wanted to close with is where we start to get into the diamonds data set. Ultimately, from a new user's standpoint of uh, being able to quickly plot things and, and kind of really learn what's going on in the undertone of, of, of mathematics and statistics, the diamonds data set is great. It also has error, so you have to also recognize that you've got to be able to add some null values in there and, and, and kind of cut those out. Uh, that'll throw your mouth all out of whack. So I did capture this uh, image. Uh, it wasn't generated from R, uh, but it, it is in the source code that Stan had referred to. If you want to uh, actually go to the ggplot book source code, um, this image is available. Uh, for one-dimensional continuous data or 1D data, the histogram is argu arguably the most uh, important geome within all of ggplot. I don't say that because you have to use it. I'm implying it that it's the simplest way of just getting a bell curve or histogram uh, uh, plotting of your data. Others may be more uh, apt for using other geomes, and there's no argument for that. Um, the author is making a point that um, histograms are the simplest way to just visualize data. Okay. The first point that we do here is using the diamonds data set and then we use the aesthetic of depth. We pass it to a histogram. And so in this section, what we're referring to is the fact that you may have to change or manipulate your bin value, your bin width. Uh, we talk a lot about bin width here. Um, Currently, uh, it says pick a better value for bin width because it's not really showing anything of value in this first histogram. If I scroll to the next, you can see that the author has added a bin width value of 10, or sorry, 0 0.1, uh, a tenth of a value. We also give it a X limit it, uh, or, or X limit value of 55 and 70. So this is going to be our floor and our ceiling, uh, or our minimum value and our maximum value. So it's ignoring anything beyond less than 55 or greater than 70. It's only plotting the paths of X variable 55 to 70 and that's it. And so what you'll find happening in this case is your data looks a lot different. You have a lot more visual pleasing understanding of what's going on. So, all right. The statement I wanted to add this text at the bottom. I said, never rely on the defaults. Uh, the author, Mr. Wickham, makes a comment here. Never rely on the defaults of the, of the uh, geome itself. Go ahead and add some additional uh, variance or, or focus on what you're doing, giving your the upper and lower limits of the data that you're plotting. You may not always be able to see uh, the relationship of X and Y 
until you start to scale or zoom in, zoom out. And again, I'm sorry for using that term. I put it in quotation marks because I don't think it's technically accurate. Um, I'm thinking in like a scroll wheel. Um, I'm an older person, so my eyesight is getting worse and I always have to make the text on my screen bigger so that I can see it. So I zoom in and zoom out. Uh, there is no hard or fast rule to this subject of bin width, uh, only experiment, experimentation uh, to discover the correlation in your plot. So you're able to interact with it, uh, giving it different uh, width values and, and, and uh, floor and ceiling values, minimum and maximum values, uh, so that you can uh, get a visual pleasing uh, correlation. Uh, for your audience, your reader, as our new upcoming users of ggplot, uh, as your audience and reader viewing this, always, always, always ensure that you add the bin width as a caption or a figure, uh, a, a y, uh, y label, X label. Try to give them some level of scale of what you're representing with your plot. Otherwise, it's not going to present to the screen and nobody will quite understand or comprehend how to replicate it. Um, again, that's not my rule. I just wanted to, I felt that that was very important in our text. Let me finish this last uh, comment, uh, this last uh, bullet, and then I'll stop at the um, color signs here in a moment. Three ways to compare distributions. Uh, the first one is we can show small multiples uh, with the histogram using a facet wrap and then passing the variable. Uh, team, can, if you don't mind me asking a rhetorical question, what does the tilde represent in this uh, call with facet wrap? Is it approximate? Like I think it's like by, so like you're like faceting, you're creating multiple plots and you're saying yeah. by some categorical variable. I think the tilde just means by, at least that's how I say it to myself. Very good. Uh, again, this, this uh, markdown didn't separate it. I may need to add a space here. But uh, the second is using color or frequency within the polygon. Uh, you, can, you can do that with geom freak polygon, frequency polygon. And then the third is using a conventional, uh, conditional density plot. Uh, and we can do that with a position fill. So what we're representing in this case is that uh, changing the color of our different variables give a better representation of, of the media that we're, we're visualizing. Again, everything about grammar for graphics is taking a data set and then making it visually pleasing, right? Or trying to find some correlation visually in, in the data. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and stop there because we are at the top of the uh, one hour mark. Uh, Priyanka or Ryan, do you want to uh, close or do you have any remarks? I don't have enough time to finish. Uh, there's a couple comments or a couple yes. thumbs up in the comments about potentially doing part two of this section next week. Okay. I don't know if you're up for that, Ryan. I'm apt for it. Uh, uh, next week will be the 11th, I believe. And oh, that's uh, Columbus Day. Um, yeah, I can week. Yeah, I can definitely continue it uh, on the 18th. Um, I, Priyanka, if you notice the poll request I put in there, uh, I updated the schedule with uh, the chapter six uh, mapping. And Gustavo, I may ping you directly on the side uh, discussing the, the mapping side. I would be more than happy to continue if, if you would like as a team. Oh, I'm sure. Um, and I, I, but I was seeing there were some people interested in coming back next week. So oh. uh, we, we can chat about this on Slack, but um, if you want to discuss here, uh, either way is fine. Uh, is there, are there more than, uh, like, are there pe more people interested in continuing to talk, you know, even without a presentation is fine? you know, do some, I don't know, live coding and things like that. I am intending, Priyanka and the group, uh, I am intending to push this up to our ggplot book. Excuse me, that's mm -hmm. another one. Original here. Um, I did put in a pull request uh, for the uh, text that I'm including here and okay. that uh, I can definitely uh, add additional services. I told you that I was cutting off on the presentation. Right. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't get, I, I didn't get, uh, I, I didn't get the pull request notification. So you can do okay. make the changes and I can maybe look at re review it later okay. tonight. That's okay. 
Okay, so I guess this should be all. Um, and uh, we can continue uh, discussion on uh, Slack to see if we want to reconvene. Um, maybe we'll have less people. I'm not sure of myself if I'll be available on next Monday, Columbus Day. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's fine if um, some of us want to meet and um, do a little chit chat with the code and do some live coding, share more thoughts on specifically these topics, these topics that we had covered so far. Um, in fact, one of the topics from last week also is, uh, you know, due for discussion that Stan has posted and I, th I I had mentioned I would do it myself, but I didn't get a chance to spend time on it. So we could maybe if I if I'm able to join in and you know, same with others, if you want to pick up these topics and uh, dig deeper, um, go through some code examples, I think it might be it might be a good idea. And I think with that thought, um, thank you, Ryan, for uh, taking this one. And um, so I guess, yeah, I mean, we, we are, that's it for the day. And uh, we'll meet again next week. Some of us, maybe <laughs> we can, uh, again, talk about this on the Slack if you, if anybody wants to start the discussion. Um, but then if not, we formally reconvene um, week after on October 18th. And we'll uh, pick up this uh, rest of the text from this one and uh, we'll continue the maps. So, all right, thank you everyone for joining in and uh, we'll come back again. See you all soon later. Bye -bye. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.